A convicted Baltimore serial killer has died this weekend. Joe Matheny, the bald man in the video, was found dead in his cell. The 62-year-old was serving two life sentences without parole. Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Joseph Metheny was born on March 2, 1955 in Baltimore, Maryland. His father was a drunk and he would often assault his family. By the time Joseph turned six, his father died in a car accident, leaving his mother to care for the six children on her own. To support her family, she worked several jobs, causing Joseph and his siblings to be left alone and raise themselves. Joseph claimed that he was basically living like a foster child because his mother had sent him off to live with different people. When he got older, he would tell people that both of his parents had died. This was a lie though because his mother was alive and well and denied all of Joseph's claims and accusations. She did admit that she was poor and worked as a barmaid, a waitress, and a food truck driver to support her family, and she tried her best to give her children a normal life and she made sure her kids were never hungry. Despite the accusations against her, she claimed that Joseph was an above average student who was always very polite to others. She was quoted saying, he was smart and had a good childhood. If he was neglected, it was his own fault. It was pretty good at home. Who knows what the truth really was for Joseph's upbringing. All we do know is that he was not happy and disliked his mother enough to tell others that she was dead. By the time Joseph turned 18, he decided to join the army. His mother claimed that he served in Germany, but Joseph claimed that he did a tour in Vietnam. He also claimed that while in Vietnam, he discovered heroin for the first time and became addicted to it while he was in an artillery unit. Joseph began losing contact with all of his family. His mother was quoted saying, he just kept drifting further and further away. I think the worst thing that ever happened to him was drugs. It's a sad, sad story. Although Joseph's time in service could never be verified after the war in Vietnam had ended, when he made it back to the States, he began working as a truck driver. Along with getting a job, he also found a girlfriend and the two had a son together in 1988. With his truck driving gigs, he was away from home for long periods of time, but he often thought about settling down. He never acted on this thought though, and one night after a long truck driving job, he found out that it was too late to settle down because his girlfriend had left with their son. Joseph claimed that she was a drug addict and he thought that she ran off with another man. He disregarded the fact that he too was a crack and heroin addict who also liked to dabble in excessive drinking. Although he did have a stable job, it turns out that he wasn't away from home for long periods of time solely because of work. He was spending a lot of time in bars and living with homeless men in South Baltimore makeshift camps. He would use up all of his hard-earned money on drugs. Joseph was angered not having his girlfriend by his side, so he went out in the community looking for her. He went into drug houses, he looked under bridges, and all through the streets to find her. Finally, after some time, he went to Tent City, which is a homeless campsite under Baltimore's Hanover Street Bridge. In Tent City, Joseph found two men who he knew knew his girlfriend. The two men were Randall Brewer and Randy Pike. He asked them about where his girlfriend was, but they refused to help him in any way. More angered that they were unwilling to help him, Joseph, with an axe on his persons, began assaulting them with it. Joseph's rage did not subside and he ended up killing Randall and Randy. All of a sudden, he noticed that a fisherman was staring at him and witnessed the murders, so he made his way to where the fisherman was and killed him as well. Three murders in a matter of minutes. Some would say a crime of passion, but not wanting to be caught, Joseph dumped the bodies in the river the fisherman was fishing in. Six months went by since he had committed his first murders, and he was still unable to find his girlfriend, despite never taking a break from looking for her. Joseph was finally getting bits and pieces of information. He found out that his girlfriend started dealing drugs and moved in with a man who was a drug dealer himself. The two were busted selling drugs and got locked up. His son was taken away and put into the system for protection because Joseph's girlfriend never communicated that he was the boy's father. In 1995, some homeless men in Tent City had a dispute and there were so-called rival homeless groups in the area. A man named Larry Amos was able to get a hold of the murder weapon that Joseph used to kill Randy, Randall, and the fishermen. Larry used the weapon to kill another homeless man by the name of Everett Dowell. On August 2, 1995, the same day Larry killed Everett, 
His body was found, along with Randall and Randy's bodies. Larry was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, but after pleading guilty to a manslaughter charge, he was sentenced to eight years in prison. He did not serve his full prison sentence and was released after serving one year and nine months in prison. Joseph was eventually questioned by police and he was put on trial for the murder of Randall and Randy after admitting to his crimes. He spent a year and a half in county jail, but despite spilling everything to authorities, in 1996, a jury concluded that there was insufficient evidence to convict him, so they let him go and he was a free man. It also turns out that Randall, Randy, and the fishermen were not his first murders. In 1994, Joseph had killed a 39-year-old woman by the name of Kathy Ann Magaziner. He got away with her murder by burying her in a shallow grave at a factory where he worked. After being undiscovered for more than two years, Joseph later admitted that he dug her up after six months, put her head in a box, and threw it in the trash before covering the rest of her body back up again. With no evidence, authorities did not take Joseph seriously, and Joseph was able to temporarily get away with the murder of Kathy Ann Magaziner. After all of the drama and years passing by, Joseph could still not get over his girlfriend. He began a killing rampage and targeted sex workers who were addicted to crack or heroin like he was. He would always ask about his girlfriend as well, and any sex worker he hurt, it was because of the woman who left him. During this time, Joseph was now working for a meat company, along with working as a forklift driver at a pallet factory making $7 an hour. His honest paying job and his killing was not enough excitement for him, so Joseph decided to take it a step further. After each woman he killed, he would make their meat look like fresh, appealing animal meat and sell it to the public. If that wasn't sadistic enough, Joseph set up a roadside barbecue stand and sold barbecue sandwiches and barbecue meat cuts. His customers thought his food was some of the best barbecue in town. Little did they know they were eating prime homo sapien burgers and cooked thighs from drug addicted sex workers. Joseph claimed that the meat was no different than pork and no one would ever be able to tell the difference. He was quoted saying, I opened up a little open pit beef stand. I had real roast beef and pork sandwiches. They were very good. The human body taste was very similar to pork. If you mix it together, no one can tell the difference. Joseph eventually met up with two sex workers in the span of a couple of months. In November 1996, he met up with a Kimberly Lynn Spicer and asked for details about his girlfriend. She knew information but refused to share anything with him, so he killed her. In December 1996, Joseph, who was now staying at a trailer which was stationed on a pallet factory site, invited a Rita Kemper over to his place to share drugs. Joseph attempted to have sexual relations with her, but she refused and ran out of the trailer. Big Joe chased her down, physically assaulted her, brought her back to his trailer, and attempted to take advantage of her again. Rita was fortunate enough to escape through a window of the trailer and immediately made her way to the first police officer she laid her eyes on. She told the officers that Joseph said, I'm going to kill you and bury you in the woods with the other girls. Before police were able to catch up with Joseph, he asked a friend of his to help him bury Kimberly Spicer. He had been hiding her body at the factory site for over a month and she had still not been laid to rest. Instead of helping Joseph, the friend decided to report him to the police. Joseph was arrested on December 15, 1996 after leaving a Christmas party. That same day, Joseph led authorities to Kimberly Spicer's body and he was charged with murder. Also arrested and charged as an accessory after the fact for helping Joseph dispose of evidence was the owner of the factory site. Joseph had no issues confessing to not only killing Kimberly Spicer, but 10 other victims. He led police to a shallow grave where he had buried parts of his first victim, Kathy Ann, back in 1994. When speaking with detectives, Joseph told them that he chose young white sex workers who were addicted to heroin and cocaine, all because of his girlfriend. He was never able to say X because he continued to believe that she was still his. Joseph ended up getting indicted for killing 28-year-old Tony Ingracia, but the charges were dropped for lack of evidence. There were more prostitutes he admitted to killing, but he was never charged for the murders because there was not enough evidence. It could have been because too much of the women were eaten and there was nothing left of them, or Joseph was unable to pinpoint their exact locations because he would throw the leftover bodies in the Patapsco River. Being that bodies were never found, no one knows the true number of victims Joseph killed. Joseph's first trial after being busted again for murder was in 1997, and he was tried for the crimes against Rita Kemper. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. 
Despite Rita being a surviving victim and testifying about what she experienced at the hands of Joseph, he was acquitted of attempted murder. In 1998, he was tried and sentenced to death for the murder of Kimberly Spicer. During the sentencing phase, Joseph was able to speak to the court and he was quoted saying that he enjoyed what he was doing, got a rush out of it, got a high out of it, and had no real excuse other than he liked to do it. Showing no emotion whatsoever, his defense team still tried telling the court that Joseph was a remorseful man who had a hard time due to the drinking and drugs. They said that the illegal substances changed his personality and forced him to become a violent person. Joseph wanted to be sentenced to death though. He was quoted during the sentencing phase saying, the words I'm sorry will never come out for they will be a lie. I am more than willing to give up my life for what I have done, to have God judge me and send me to hell for eternity. In August of 1998, he pled guilty for killing Kathy Ann Magaziner. Although prosecutors were aiming for another death sentence, Joseph was sentenced to life in prison. After lengthy appeals, his previous death sentence was overturned in 2000, and his new sentence was life without the possibility of parole. Typically, when there is a robbery in the process of a murder, it automatically qualifies for the death penalty in death penalty states, but his death sentence was overturned because they felt there was not enough evidence that proved robbery was his motivation when he committed the murders. It is unclear though what prosecutors said he stole while in the process of committing murder. Joseph was sent to the Western Correctional Institute in Maryland and on August 5, 2017, at 3 in the afternoon, a prison guard found 62-year-old Joseph unresponsive in his cell. Joseph had a single cell and there was no foul play. It was concluded that he died of natural causes. Before dying alone in his cell, he penned a letter to the public. The letter read, the next time you're riding down the road and you happen to see an open pit beef stand that you've never seen before, make sure you think about this story before you take a bite of that sandwich. Sometimes you never know who you may be eating. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. Let me know what you guys think of this story in the comments below. Also, I made a new channel called Jailbird Love. It has been interesting to see comments of people saying they have fallen in love with inmates, have written death row inmates, and more. I even told a story where a female tried to sue the prison because the death row inmate she was in love with had many different girlfriends. She thought that she was scammed. So on that channel, I am reading profiles from Pentacon.com and I briefly talk about their crime and read their profiles looking for love. On November 2nd, 2015, at the Carriage Place Apartments in Spindale, North Carolina, where 22-year-old Tyler Bowman lived. I would describe myself as a writer, although I have nothing published yet. Being strong mentally and physically is important to me, so I enjoy exercising often and reading quite a bit. P.O. Box 247, Phoenix, Maryland, 21131, U.S.